Coming up, a critical look at America's wars. I, I loathe the term collateral damage. I just despise it. And I think that um, you know, it's, it, it makes war easier to wage when you don't see the other as a human being. Dirty Wars author Jeremy Scahill discusses America's covert wars and targeted killings and the ethical and political repercussions. It's just ahead on Global Ethics Forum. Jeremy Scahill is a national security correspondent for The Nation magazine. His 2008 bestseller, Blackwater, The Rise of the World's Most Powerful Mercenary Army, exposed the sordid consequences that have followed the outsourcing of the U.S. war on terror. His latest book is the New York Times bestseller, Dirty Wars, The World is a Battlefield. It has since been accompanied by a spellbinding documentary of the same name. I had the pleasure of watching the movie just a few days ago, and it was clear that it was a real emotional process of, of working your way through this movie. Um, I found myself in tears more than once. And I was wondering if you found that the making of the film affected you in ways that writing the book did not. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, um, I, was, I, I realized when we were finishing up the film that I sort of was gutted as a person in the process of doing it. I'm not someone who writes articles in the first person. For most of my adult life, I've been uh, a reporter. And uh, much of what I do is go to places and try to be on the other side of the missiles, embedded with civilians. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a military journalist. I generally don't embed. And um, when we first start out, started out to make the movie, uh, I was going to be in it, but I wasn't going to be myself. I was going to be sort of more like a tour guide through this archipelago of covert war sites. And when we decided to make it more of a personal journey, then I, I think I had to confront the reality of what it means to spend 15 years with victims of US bombing raids or night raids. And, uh, and it does change you. you know, I think when you cover war, you think that you could just jump from one place to the other and it doesn't set in. And in the process of doing that reporting, the floodgates opened and I, uh, I realized how many stories I carried with me and internalized. And so it was, yeah, it was very personal. And it was strange for me because I usually don't talk about those things. Right. And you've really chosen to dedicate your career to these conflict zones and war zones. Why, why is that? I mean, why do you keep on going back? Yeah, you know, I, um, one of the first trips I ever took as a reporter was in, uh, in 1998. I went to Iraq, and at the time, President Clinton yeah, was in office, and there was very little attention country. being paid to Iraq outside of Saddam Hussein. And, you know, of course, President Clinton conducted uh, a bombing campaign in December of 1998 uh, where there was a, an attempt to degrade Saddam's military uh, infrastructure in Baghdad. Um, but, but what actually was the story in Iraq under Clinton was this devastating regime of economic sanctions. It was sort of a form of economic warfare. In theory, it was aimed at weakening Saddam's regime, but what I found when I started reporting there is that it generally was having a devastating impact on the civilian population and, in a way, strengthening Saddam's stranglehold on power because people were, were struggling just to live. No one could, be, could really organize against the regime. And, um, and I visited uh, hospitals throughout the country, and, and they really were like death rows for infants. You know, there were basic medical supplies weren't there. They were reusing syringes. There were birth defects that didn't exist in modern medical journals because of some of the munitions that were used starting in the 91 Gulf War. And I, I remember being in a hospital in Basra and watching a woman give birth to a, a, a stillborn child that had a gaping hole from his nose to his throat. And the doctors were saying, you know, we've been seeing this happen often. And her husband had been in the Gulf War. Um, and, uh, and I remember thinking, I was very young at the time, Americans need to see this. They need to know these stories. I mean, we're, we're, we're told that, we're, that these are our enemies. But what did these people actually do to us? And a lot of what I've tried to do over the years is to humanize people on the other side. I, I loathe the term collateral damage. I just despise it. And I think that. Um, you know, it's, it, it makes war easier to wage when you don't see the other as a human being. And so a lot of my reporting has been aimed at trying to humanize people on the other side so that we have a real debate in this country, not an abstract one about people that are categorized as enemies or collateral damage. Right. I think one of the, the more controversial theses of your latest book is the notion that the war on terror is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. I mean, I, I, th I think we've, you know, after 9-11, the majority of Americans supported going into Afghanistan with the narrowly defined mission of bringing those responsible uh, for the 9-11 attacks to justice. And here we are 12 years later in a totally different administration um, justifying drone bombings in Yemen or a covert campaign in Somalia, in some cases aimed at people who were toddlers on 9-11 and had no actual connection whatsoever to those attacks. And I think what we've done over these 12 years of both Democratic and Republican administrations 
um, is to implement a policy in the name of security that ultimately degrades our national security. We're giving people a legitimate reason to want to harm the United States or take up arms against it. And I've, I've come to the conclusion that our own policies are creating more new enemies than they are killing terrorists. And I think we're encouraging a, a radicalization of people uh, and, and giving them an actual incentive to want to, uh, to harm us. And that's a pretty sobering thing to say as an American, but I think it's true. Well, in May, President Obama gave, gave a speech examining his, uh, the drone strike policy. He laid it out as, as both legal and morally mm -hmm. just. I mean, can you envision a drone policy that is laced in morals? If you boil down what President Obama said in his speech, um, there were a lot of there was a lot of rhetoric aimed at, at liberals who are increasingly concerned about this. So he says things like, "I'm I'm going to be haunted until the day I die by the civilian deaths," and that it is not constitutional. And 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 nor do I believe that any president should use a drone uh, on U.S. soil, a weaponized drone on U.S. soil, to kill an American citizen. And that we want to narrow the scope of these uh, these drone strikes. So there's one way of looking at it and saying, "Wow, he's really trying to reform the program." And I think that to a, to a degree that's true. But there's another way to boil it down to its rawest form. And what, what we have is a Democratic president who's very popular with liberals asserting that the United States, in fact, has the right to conduct assassination operations in any country around the world that it deems there to be a threat. Now that the term du jour is against US persons, which is a very vague term. And, and the way I see it is that Cheney and, and company are probably sitting somewhere in their caves, somewhat thankful that Obama has cleaned it up for them, because the next president, if it's particularly if it's a Republican that takes office, is going to have pretty firm ground to stand on in re-expanding these operations. And liberals who were largely silent um, are going to have a very difficult time criticizing a Republican for wanting to do some of these same things. You know, there's no such thing as a Democratic Hellfire missile and a Republican Hellfire missile. And I think that sometimes the debate in our society seems to encourage the idea that there's somehow, you know, Democratic cruise missiles and Republican cruise missiles, and it's just simply not the case. I'm going to turn a little bit now back to, to Dirty Wars. You've complimented the book with a movie, and Amnesty International has also launched a, a campaign to eradicate this notion of the globe as a battlefield. Yeah. In terms of, of how you envision the role of investigative journalism, um, clearly you see a need to reach beyond just writing the book. Um, do, do you view this as a need for a, a more multifaceted kind of activist uh, campaign? There, there were, we had some pressure to make it like an activist film and to end it with a series of calls to action and this is what people can do and this is what you could tell your congressperson and we really fiercely resisted that. Um, and so instead we ended it on a series of questions about what happens to us as a society when we start to see what's been hidden in plain sight um, and how does a war like this uh, ever end. Uh, because I, I, I think we really are sort of at ground zero in this, in this discussion and you know, we're working with Amnesty International on a couple of specific issues that I think we can have some success on. This notion that the United States is asserting the right to conduct op war operations anywhere around the world. Um, you know, that, that, that ultimately is going to backfire on us. When, when China or Russia start to subscribe to those same doctrines, how are we going to stand up and say, oh, actually, you can't do that? I mean, the, the, the hypocrisy of the U.S. government on the issue of an international criminal court and international law in general, our assertion that we can use cluster bomb munitions uh, you know, and won't sign on to those treaties, but when other countries use devastating anti-personnel weapons, we condemn them at the United Nations. The sort of hypocrisy that is sort of underlining our policy under Democratic and Republican administrations should be confronted. The other issue we're working with Amnesty International on is that there's a journalist in Yemen named Abdullah Lahaider Shaya who had exposed the impact of the first strike, military strike, that President Obama authorized on Yemen. In December of 2009, Obama started authorizing bombing, a bombing campaign in Yemen. And that first strike, we were told, was not a US strike, but a Yemeni strike. And we were told that it was against an Al Qaeda camp and that 34 Al Qaeda members were killed. Well, this Yemeni journalist goes there and films the carnage uh, afterwards and films cruise missile parts there. And then emailed them to Amnesty International and they had a munitions expert look at them and say, these have to be US weapons. So he started reporting on this. And he had video footage of children, uh, bodies of children being pulled from the rubble and women. And, uh, and then I eventually I went eventually and investigated went this on the ground in Yemen. But this reporter who first went there and broke the story was eventually arrested in Yemen and put in prison and then put on trial as being an Al-Qaeda facilitator. And he was sentenced to five years in prison. When the dictator of Yemen, Ali Abdullah Saleh, was preparing to pardon him, there was tremendous pressure from human rights groups and media freedom groups around the world. 
um, it, word leaked in the Yemeni media that he was going to be pardoned. And that day, the dictator of Yemen got a phone call from the White House, not from some undersecretary of something, but from President Obama personally. And President Obama said, we're deeply concerned that you're going to release this guy. And the pardon was ripped up. And he remains in prison to this day. And I've looked deeply into who this journalist was. He was a great independent journalist who was asking tougher questions than anyone in the Washington press corps ever asks a US official. And he was asking it of Al Qaeda members. He was reporting on an expanding covert US war in the country. And I believe he's in prison because of his journalism. And so Amnesty International has agreed with us and we've launched a campaign to urge President Obama to drop his, uh, his position that this journalist should remain in prison. When you take that in combination with the targeting of the phone records of the Associated Press and the citing of journalists and criminal indictments and the general surveillance state, uh, it's hard to feel like there's not a kind of emerging war against journalism and whistleblowers mm -hmm. in this country that I think ultimately undermines our democratic values or principles. If, if you look at your, your work as a whole, I think you can get a pretty um, pessimistic view about the role of, of the U.S. We have abroad. Dirty Wars razor blades that we pass out. So it's a, <laughs> <no>. <laughs> Uh, you can you can come away with a with a pretty negative perception about how the U.S. engages abroad. Do you envision a role for the United States abroad in terms of promoting its values and promoting democracy? Is is there a role to play? Of course, but I think that we've we've damaged our credibility in the world so dramatically, uh, particularly under. I mean, Bush was had a Ph.D. in damaging our credibility around the world. So I don't mean to make it seem like Obama. I mean, I and I do truly think of like Cheney as a cartoonish villain, like in a lair somewhere, plotting the destruction of the world for the benefit of Halliburton stock. I don't see President Obama in the same way. But what I think, you know, from traveling, particularly in the Muslim world, I think what's happened is that we've sent a message because of, particularly because of the drone issue, um, and and also Guantanamo and the failure to close Guantanamo, which of course is part Republican and part the White House at play here. We've sent a message that it doesn't actually matter uh, who who the president of the United States is. I think for for large sections of the Muslim world, that's been the message that we've sent. And President Obama had said that he wanted to reset that relationship, and he gave the speech early on in in Cairo. But I think largely what's happened is that people feel like it really doesn't matter who America elects. And that's, that's a problem. One specific example I'll give you, when the CIA used this doctor in Pakistan to run the fake polio vaccination program, the, the impact of that is, is, is devastating. Po Pakistan is one of the few countries in the world still facing pol a polio problem. Uh, no aid organizations can do vaccinations now because they're assumed to be spies. And I think that, you know, that, that to me is sort of a microcosm of, of, the, of, of the broader picture of what we've done. We're, we're doing all, taking all sorts of actions in the pursuit of killing a relatively tiny group of terrorists. Um, and in the process, I think, uh, damaging our relations with the rest of the world. So yes, I see that. And I, I would want nothing more than our nation and our government to be able to project that kind of message to the world or encourage that kind of perception of the United States. But I don't, I, I, don't, I don't think we can do that right now. And I, I, I think we as a society have to take a humility pill about what our own role in the world has been. I think a lot of people are genuinely worried that there will be another 9-11. Do you have a sense of how big the threat is? I mean, how many terrorists are there out there? And how worried should we be that we would give up our civil rights and do immoral things? Well. I mean, I don't, I don't even think that international terrorism ranks in the top 10 threats facing the country. Um, I think that uh, terrorism does not pose an existential threat uh, to the country. I think we have a far greater, our, our economic situation for most Americans is, represents a far greater threat uh, to their livelihood and their lives and also to the stability of our country. Um, that's not to say that there aren't terrorists that are plotting to blow up American airplanes. There are. And, um, and I, I don't live in la-la land on that. Uh, my, my concern is that in pursuing these individuals uh, who are plotting against the United States and in uh, widening the sandbox of where we're targeting them, that we're uh, encouraging others to want to engage in those kinds of plots. I mean, I, I recently have been reading Clinton-era documents on the kill program. And if you read what Clinton is, and his advisors, their strategy on terrorism was that terrorism is a crime and that it should be dealt with through the lens of law enforcement and that the use of military force outside of a declared battlefield should be almost, uh, almost off the charts completely 
but if necessary, extremely rare. And Richard Clark, the former senior counterterrorism advisor, said that the Clinton authorizations for the initial go-ahead to assassinate Osama bin Laden were Talmudic in nature. And they were almost built so that there would only be one scenario if he was in a certain kind of a house with a particular brand of lock on the door, you know, and, 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 and only three trees and not four, then you can strike the house. I mean, it was, there were all these sort of qualifications in it. And, but I think there was some wisdom in that. You know, there was this, uh, after 9-11, there were these secret hearings, and, and, and some Clinton-era officials said, you know, we're, I'm concerned that we're going to create an Israeli-style hit list and, and this, give this perception that America is assassinating people. And, um, and so I think that the actual debate to be having is when we have actual evidence that people are engaged in those plots, how do we handle it? If we have a ticking time bomb scenario, someone is, the president gave this example, someone has a sniper rifle pointed at a crowd of innocent people. I personally don't believe that law enforcement needs to go and seek an indictment to take that person out. I mean, that's, that's a ridiculous notion. If they're going to shoot a room full of children, you don't have to go and get a judge to sign off and say, you know, you're not extrajudicially killing that person by taking him out simply because you didn't charge him with a crime and give him a trial. And so in those narrow cases where we're talking about if this person isn't taken out, uh, many, many people are going to die, then, then that's one debate. But the, that is not the majority of, of the cases that we're facing here. We're engaged in pre-crime. And, and I think it undermines our own values. And, and you know, that's why the killing of Anwar al laki this American citizen, who, I, I mean, I'm willing to concede for the sake of argument that he was involved with everything that the White House alleged about him in secret, and then more recently the president came out and admitted that uh, he had authorized the operation that killed Anwar al laki But let's say that's true. Let's say he's plotting against the United States, he directed the Christmas Day bomb plot, uh, and he was plotting to poison U.S. water supplies. They have him under surveillance for 30 days in Yemen, in a village with 10 houses. What efforts did they make to actually ap apprehend this American citizen before deciding to execute him? He was never indicted on any charges of terrorism. He never had any of the evidence publicly presented against him. He was simply sentenced to death by the constitutional law professor, Nobel Peace Prize winning Democratic president. And, and, and to me, it's not a defense of Anwar al -Laki. Anwar al just by, based on things he said, I found him utterly re reprehensible. And I'm willing to believe that he was involved with, with these plots and not just encouraging it with his rhetoric. But it says a lot about who we are as a society, how we deal with it. And, and what I, I get attacked on this all the time, but I, I feel like people have to understand one thing about this. Like, if you actually study the case there, what is the definition of the term imminent? The Justice Department has redefined that term to mean that if there's a possibility that if you're going to strike against the United States at any point, that you represent a permanent, imminent threat to the country. And, and, and so if we're getting into the business then of saying for certain Americans, but also for non-Americans, uh, we're gonna fast forward past the evidence phase and just sentence you to death. To me, that is a dangerous line we're crossing as a society. So I would advocate for an approach where we go back to viewing terrorism as a crime, get out of the business of pre-crime assassination strikes, um, and only in those cases when there's an actual imminent threat. Uh, and, and by imminent meaning what most normal people would think of as the definition of imminent, do we consider taking any kind of lethal action against people plot, engaged in these plots? That, that to me would be a more responsible policy that would result in far less blowback against our country. You made a, a statement that the United States uh, had a role in destabilizing Somalia, and I wonder if you could elaborate on that a little bit and what specifically, uh, what period you're referring right. to. Uh, well, of course, Somalia, you know, when, when the Siad Bari regime fell uh, in the early 1990s and the warlords took over the country, President Clinton authorized U.S. forces to participate in an international peacekeeping operation. And I think what most people know about is the Black Hawk Down episode where JSOC, uh, the Joint Special Operations Command and other U.S. Special Forces and Special Operations Forces tried to dismantle the leadership of Mohammed Farah Idid, this brutal, thuggish warlord's uh, apparatus. Uh, and of course, then the Black Hawk helicopters were brought down and these army rangers were killed and dragged through the streets. And after that, and when the U.S. pulled out and the U.N. ultimately pulled out, the warlords basically took control of the country and utterly destroyed Somalia. After 9-11, Somalia was on the early list of countries uh, that Rumsfeld and, uh, and the CIA were looking at for U.S. intervention because initially there was a belief that the people that had blown up the U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania were seeking refuge in Somalia. And most U.S. experts on Somalia at the time estimated that there were maybe 7 to 12 Al-Qaeda members in the country. Uh, and, and, and the U.S. backed away from doing an overt invasion, but instead 
started to hire some of the warlords to hunt down these individuals, including people that were attached to the uh, embassy bomb plots. And, the, and so the warlords were getting weapons and finances from the CIA. And they started basically a, a kill program. And they ended up murdering uh, hundreds of people in the name of uh, fighting terrorism and, and literally kind of at, at points bringing bodies to the Americans and saying, we killed this guy. And, and, it, and, and there were reports by the International Crisis Group and others looking at who actually was killed. There were very few people that were killed that had any connections to international terrorism. And there was a relatively small threat. But our financing and funding of the warlords sparked uh, an Islamist uprising within Somalia that led to uh, the establishment in 2006 of a government called the Islamic Courts Union. There were 12 Sharia courts regionally based around Somalia that came together, overthrew the CIA's warlords, and took control of Mogadishu. That government was a Taliban-style government, but it did stabilize Mogadishu. They reopened the ports, and the, uh, the fighting almost entirely ended in the city. Uh, six months later, the U.S. partnered with the Ethiopian military. Ethiopia is Somalia's sworn enemy. And Ethiopia invaded Somalia and overthrew the Islamic Courts Union government and then conducted a, a three-year occupation of Somalia in which there was mass brutality of Ethiopian forces against Somali civilians. Um, and, and what happened was that that gave rise to a very radical organization uh, called Al-Shabaab which at the time uh, of the Islamic Courts Union was a relatively minor player because the Somalis very passionately rejected the presence of foreign fighters. Uh, by going in and, and overthrowing the Islamic Courts Union government and the fact that the United States also had forces in the country, JSOC and the CIA, gave the perception that the US was once again trying to come into Somalia. And, and Al-Shabaab maximized the propaganda value of that and portrayed itself as the Islamist vanguard against crusaders trying to come into Somalia. And so our policy encouraged and aided this organization's rise when they had largely been kept in, uh, in check. Uh, today, uh, al-Shabaab has largely been pushed out of the Somali capital. There is still fighting in southern Somalia. Um, but once again, there's a you know, multi-thousand member African Union uh, force, primarily Ugandans and Burundians. And you, know, you have regular battles in the, in the city. I think, I mean, I have great hope that Somalia can stabilize because they so deserve to not live in utter bloodshed. But I mean, I think we've, we've played a, largely a, uh, a negative role in Somalia for much of the past uh, 12 years. I hope that that's going to change. I mean, I, I, a lot of Somalis I know are hopeful for the first time in a while. Uh, but I do think we've, we've, we've played a rather unsavory role in creating or worsening the situation in Somalia over these 12 years. Did you, did you want to follow up? Because I kind of hit at well, you. So I had no idea that uh, we were responsible for all the warlords and, and uh, this great assassination program. Uh, where is this all written up? I mean, how do you, how do you know this, really? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, for, first of all, I mean, I, I spent expense, extensive time. And you can go through the footnotes of my book. I, one of the main tracks of my book is about this, and it's all documented. I mean, the Combating Terrorism Center at West Point has, for instance, one of the best reports. Uh, the International Crisis Group has done extensive reporting on it, Human Rights Watch. I mean, this is all out in the public domain. And if you look at some of the WikiLeaks cables also that have come out about it, a lot of the, the, the civilians that were working for the US government at the time were deeply concerned about what the US military and the CIA were doing in Somalia uh, and felt that it was running contrary to, uh, to the stated position of trying to stabilize the country and that this freelancing with warlords. But I, I didn't say that the US was responsible for all of the warlords. These, these guys are gangsters and they're all sides. I'm saying that we were supporting specific warlords. Mohammed Kanyare, who was one of the most brutal, thuggish warlords in the country. Um, Ahmed Madobe, who at one time had been a member of the Islamic Courts Union and then was flipped by the United States. I mean, th these, are, these were guys that had their own little fiefdoms that they were operating. Um, but Eritrea, for instance, has smuggled a, lot of, a tremendous amount of weapons into Somalia to support the other side of it. So the US has been engaged in a sort of proxy war that involves other regional players as well. I mean, Ethiopia probably is the chief destabilizer of the Somalia situation as a foreign power, uh, followed by the United States and Eritrea. You mentioned Afghanistan and the mess we're leaving behind. Could you uh, expand on that a little bit and say some of the things that most Americans haven't heard? Well, you know, I mean, there was, there was a poll conducted, uh, I think it was about a year and a half or two years ago, of uh, Pashtun men uh, in in Afghanistan, and I, I think this stat was that 92% had never heard of 9-11. Uh, 
um, you know, didn't know that the 9-11 attacks existed. And I thought it was, I mean, it was interesting because why, how then do they understand why we're there? I mean, I, I've met people in Afghanistan who thought that the Soviets and the U.S. were the sort of same thing. It was just sort of one general force. And, you know, in the case of both Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, my, my fear is that we, you know, we've left, we're going to leave them in a worse situation uh, than we, what, what we encountered when we went in. In Afghanistan, there are parts of the country where, you know, girls are going to school now, and people have some semblance of freedom of speech, um, and, and where uh, I think there was tremendous support for the United States being there, and a great deal of fear of what's going to happen when the U.S. leaves, and that's, that's undeniable, and, and, um, and I've seen those, those areas of Afghanistan. Um, in large parts of the rest of the country, you're still going to have the reality that the Taliban are largely in control, or, ex or entirely in control, and you've had the added uh, U.S. military presence with night raids and airstrikes that have killed a tremendous number of people. And I think that, uh, that we're, leaving, we're going to leave those areas much worse than when we came in because the, the reality of the Taliban will still be there. But then there's also thousands and thousands of deaths that have taken place as a result of our having been there. I, I'm hard pressed to find anyone these days that I know that, that has served or is serving in Afghanistan that understands anymore what the mission is there. I think, I mean, the vast majority of Americans, I think, believe that we shouldn't uh, be there anymore. Thank you. All right, thank you guys very much. For For more on this program and other Carnegie Ethics Studio productions, visit carnegiecouncil.org. There you can find video highlights, transcripts, audio recordings, and other multimedia resources on global ethics. This program is made possible by the Carnegie Ethics Studio and viewers like you.